Disclaimer. The views expressed on this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik are solely the opinions of the host and the guest. The content of the conversation is not reflective of the institutions or establishments mentioned therein. Take all these opinions with a pinch of salt and a dash of lime if needed. Namaskara, good morning, good afternoon or good evening whenever you're watching or listening and welcome to this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. My guest this week is Sydney Wong. Sydney Wong uh, is actually a cousin of one of our former uh, guests, Amanda Su, and I heard about him through her about his interests for birds and um, like researching them and their behavior and so on, which made me really curious to want to talk to someone who studied in that realm, just because it's something that we don't necessarily think about as much. But if you were to zoom out of our own bubbles and sort of think about nature and society, a lot of these birds tend to um, be affected due to our greed in society, to say the least. So there's a ton to take away from this episode in terms of bird talk. Even We even touch on certain um, aspects of global warming, climate change, and so on. Um, but unfortunately, towards the end, there were a few technical issues because of which you might notice a bit of a change in the recording. And I apologize for that. But nonetheless, there's still a lot that you can take away from this episode. So without further ado, I present to you Sydney Wong on this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. Hey Sydney, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. Uh, before you get started, please let the people know who you are, what some of your likes are, some of your dislikes, any future aspirations if you're comfortable sharing, and anything else about yourself. Uh, I'm Sydney Vong. Uh, I'm a student who, biology student who uh, really appreciates birds, uh, particularly, and. Uh, Hopefully in the future, I'm trying to see if I can do something with science education. So, yeah, something overseas. Gotcha. Yeah, American birds oh, are very cool. fun, but um, unfortunately, uh, some of the ones here in the central U.S. are a little bit uh, <laughs> not not as uh, not as fun as some of the tropical ones. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, any sort of mundane likes or dislikes, like something that you, maybe you don't like doing laundry or anything like that, that <laughs> it's part of your everyday life. Hmm. I probably spend too much time uh, playing games and uh, drawing in my free time. <laughs> what do you draw? A lot of anime stuff. I, I'm ashamed to say. Mm -hmm. Just kidding. It's not actually that shameful. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a good way that I've uh, connected with a lot of friends online and uh, actually part of the way that I've... Uh, been able to just uh, hang out with some uh, people in my lab too hmm. Hmm. Yeah. cool 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 there's a lot of interesting things that uh that's there for us to unpack so we're gonna get started <laughs> with what you mentioned initially and one of the reasons why that we're having this conversation you said birds um and when uh, your cousin amanda who's been on the podcast on episode nine i'm gonna link that below for anybody who's interested in watching uh, that episode if you haven't already but uh, yeah, she mentioned to me that uh, she had a cousin who was interested in birds. And I was like, wow, that'd be an interesting conversation to have, you know. So um, to get us started, what, what, what was the curiosity or behind you wanting to sort of learn more about birds? Well, it all started initially uh, back in uh, college. So I was mm -hmm. uh, going to OU, University of Oklahoma, and... Like every uh, typical Asian kid going to OU, I was there for pre-med to start off. Mm. So so uh, I was taking a lot of those under prerequisite classes, a lot of science classes and stuff like that. And then I started going to a lot of the uh, actual medical courses and stuff, doing a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the uh, clubs and activities and other different things. And I started shadowing. Um, mm. But pretty quickly after that, uh, I found that I was 
I was getting a little bit hmm, a little eh, iffy on some of the uh, some of the different fields that I was going to, and uh, I was just um, not not as interested as I thought I was. So mm. once I finished, um, once I finished uh, getting through about two thirds of my um, of my undergraduate courses, I was like, you know, I I don't know what I'm gonna. What what I whether I really enjoy this and until I ran mm. into one of my professors. I was doing a summer field sampling course where we went out into mm-hmm. the field and uh, we went and when I looked at um, doing a lot of field work, gathering samples, interacting with a lot of live animals, and I was like, wow, this is pretty fun. I've enjoyed like I've enjoyed nature. I do hiking and a lot of like uh, just nature walks and stuff like that. I've done that a lot before, but I'd never really thought of it as applying to a field of study before. But, you know, I was like, oh, this Mm. is pretty interesting. So I decided to take a few more biology classes, a lot of uh, some of the uh, genetics and uh, other things that I was like, you know, if this is something that I could apply to doing some like field work that would be more interesting, then I would uh, go ahead and do that. But, um, Eventually, I stumbled upon one of my professors, uh, uh, Professor Matthew Miller. Uh, he was the ornithology professor and uh, curator for the uh, mm. uh, Sam Nolan Museum up by OU for the uh, birds. And so I was like, you know, ornithology sounds really fun. Birds are really fun. They're really unique and diverse. And there's something that is, you know, it's not like you have to go deep out into the wilderness to find like uh snakes or something like that which i was considering because uh, some of the some of the other people at my um in my classes were like oh yeah i'm doing herpetology herpetology what's that but um yeah so <laughs> i took my ornithology class and the real mm-hmm. moment that kind of like spoke to me is like oh i should really study birds birds are really interesting was when our professor organized a mm-hmm. um a long uh trip uh we took three days i believe three days to go up to black mesa which is up in the panhandle of oklahoma to go and just camp Mm -hmm. and capture and band some birds uh and those three days were really really uh enlightening to me because um one it was a whole lot of fun uh the ta that i have Mm -hmm. uh, she's fantastic uh She's uh, a pro at doing a lot of these uh, camping and stuff like that, so making our own fires, making our own kind of just fun different activities for uh, it's camping. Which I was like, wow, this is this is the first time I've ever enjoyed like camping before, because most of the time mm-hmm. camping in Oklahoma, it's uh, it's all right, but uh, not very uh, exciting, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because oklahoma weather is very um (laughs) it's not very hospitable for camping most of the time right but uh yeah eventually that one thing led to another and once i've got once i'd gotten um like hooked into like oh this is really enjoyable going out there interacting with the birds like learning how to actually encourage them into the direction that you want so that you can get them into the nets so then you can actually put the bands on them and take measurements, uh, all that sort of thing. It was really interesting. And uh, yeah, Mm. I've been doing that for quite a while until COVID hit. And then we were all told stay indoors. And I had to look at this. Mm. The only birds I got interaction with was this one uh, morning dove that made a roost, a little nest right outside my window. So, Mm. yeah. But, uh, gotcha. Yeah. And when when did you actually start doing this? If like a timeline or a year? Uh, this was my junior year. About uh, it was actually the second okay. semester of my junior year. So it was during that. It was during that uh, fall semester that I got into my ornithology class, and after mm-hmm. that, I started talking to my professor about coming on and joining his lab, doing a lot of the helping out with um, studies and just basic field work, lab work, anything I get my hands on to uh, really uh, get me in there and just uh, get me some practice, really. 
that gotcha. was gotcha. I mean, once initially when i heard about it oh go ahead you can oh, i was just trying to you said a timeline i was like oh wait what year was that but uh <laughs> yeah oh it's, it's been too long COVID has really just jumped my timeline <laughs> all over the place right what is time anymore right <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly yeah yeah um but i was gonna ask i thought i don't know why like maybe i was just sort of um, imagining but i wondered that this is something that came up a lot earlier in childhood mm-hmm. rather than something that just came up quite recently yeah it's into... yeah it's, it's it was really recent yeah definitely definitely something kind of out of left field because all my life mm. i'd been like uh my parents had been like oh yeah you're you're gonna be a great doctor and all that stuff and <laughs> do all that you, you, not to not to plant any stereotypes but you know the typical kind of uh, asian parent mentality come to america kid uh, gets a nice yeah. high paying job as a doctor or something like that mm-hmm. which yeah i still sometimes i still think about oh man what if i wasn't some poor student just uh out here like tromping around in the mud sometimes especially whenever it's like cold and rainy and hailing and there's no birds to be seen and they're all huddling safe and under some trees somewhere mm. while I'm just stopping around in the field. But um, that's just how it is. I guess sometimes just life tosses you uh, a curveball. Mm. 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 Gotcha. About that, uh, do you think that, I mean, did you notice a shift in happiness from your time studying pre-med to now getting into ornithology? I don't know whether it was necessarily like happy. I, I I definitely think I got happier once I kind of settled on what I was more interested in rather than what had been kind of just in my mind beforehand as like, that's my grand destiny for living here. But um, mm-hmm. definitely I got more invested. I spent time going out, doing like bird watching on my own. Uh, I did a project where i went out to a farm and uh did like a bird list made a bird list for them uh, enjoyed that a lot and you know even nowadays i have a lot of fun just um looking at what's around the birds here seeing if i can identify them see if i can kind of you know understand them a little bit more now that i've gotten a little bit more knowledge into that and a little bit of insight from um, learning from my professors and just spending more time actually actively looking at what they're doing. So, Mm. yeah, Mm. which is odd because my professor does a lot of bird uh, genomics and evolutionary stuff, not a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, behavioral things, but I've always, I've just kind of naturally just leaned a little bit more towards uh, explaining behaviors and uh, a lot of that, which probably is why uh, I'm kind of like, since we had a lot of uh, lab closing with all COVID and stuff like that, I've kind of leaned a little bit more towards kind of looking at some of the more behavioral sided part of uh, birds rather than, um, mm-hmm. yeah, rather than genomics and all that stuff, which is a whole, whole different story. It's uh, a lot of sitting in the lab and looking at, A's, T's, C's, and G's over and over. Mm. Yeah. Right. For so those of them who don't know the A, T, G, and C's DNA sequences mm. and uh, yeah. yeah, stuff like that, uh, mm. not DNA biology related stuff. But yeah. speaking of your interest in sort of learning the behavior of these birds, talk to me about bird watching specifically because like when somebody hears the word bird watching mm-hmm. well i'll give you a couple of contexts <laughs> it, like back so originally i'm from india right back mm-hmm. home a lot of the times or at least the part of the country that i'm from <laughs> the word bird watching is usually used when people are um what's the right word or what's something that's bored. politically correct <laughs> no uh, not necessarily bored but people who are um Stalking women. Let's put it that way. Ah, uh, I, I see. So mm-hmm. that's the sort of connotation the used for bird watching. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that is kind of intense. And when I heard like Amanda talk about you, like that you watch a lot of birds, I was like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. Like I know it's I know it's birds, birds, not 
mm-hmm. you know, women. But <laughs> what are some of the nuances of bird watching that a layman like me wouldn't understand or wouldn't know? Well, uh, one of the biggest things I think that I was most surprised by is the fact that if you sit inside your car, birds typically won't actually recognize that as like there's a person and there's there's another animal there and so you'll have birds hop down onto like your car side windows and stuff they'll land on branches right like feet away from you which if you're standing around outside like completely still birds will still realize that oh that's a human person i should uh book it and just uh yeah so even if you're not in like a particularly avid bird watcher, just having your car, just parking it somewhere a little bit out of the ways where birds can come by is actually a surprisingly mm. good way to just kind of see what birds are around. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there's that. There's I'll always, uh, <laughs> always get yourself a good set of binoculars because uh, 90% of the time birds are going to be far, far away from you. Unless you're in an area where there's a lot of birds that have acclimated to human presence, like um, kind of city areas, suburban areas. There's a lot of birds that are very, very, um, very chill with humans hanging around them. But uh, if you go out into the wild to actually see birds in their natural habitat, you're going to you're going to have to have a good zoom uh, set of binoculars Mm. because those things will uh, they're very jumpy. Hmm. What are some things that you notice while you watch birds, like in terms of their behavior? Um, I notice I usually pay attention more to like how they interact with each other. I like to mm. uh, I like to see whenever they start start to you know pick fights with each other. A lot of small birds will just you know hop around and just flap their wings uh, at each other. Try to get some of the back off. Usually it's in the spring whenever they're all foraging on the ground or doing stuff like that. But uh, Mm. I also enjoy kind of um, seeing how they have uh, different methods for um, protecting their nests. Cause uh, once you know where a Mm. nest is, it's very easy to understand like, Oh, this is something that they're actively doing to protect their nest or divert strangers away from their nest. So you'll see a lot of um, a lot of robins here. American robins will typically um, bounce around on the ground and only really kind of go up to where their nests are uh, whenever they're sure that mm. there's not a lot of uh, you know predators watching and stuff like that. Um, you'll have things like crows. There's a uh, way back in my backyard. Uh, there's a uh, whole bunch of trees over there and recently i've noticed that there's a crow back there who's she's very 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 Mm. uh strong about protecting her nest like i'll see her uh cawing and chasing around other birds uh particularly around the tree where she's uh nested up which is something that you usually Mm. only see in the spring but it's uh very interesting to watch that and just uh of course, mm. how birds react to presence of humans. They're very jumpy, but now and then sometimes you get birds that are a little bit more curious and will stick around a little bit longer before actually jumping branch and uh, moving on away from humans. And so it's it's kind of fun to think that sometimes, uh, like, oh, the bird's as interested in me as I am in them. Yeah. Mm. Although that's another, that's one of the pitfalls, mm. I do have to say. Um, from uh, one thing I've learned from my professor is don't anthropomorphize the bird's behavior too much because uh, it's easy for us to kind of mm. say, oh, this bird definitely has a human-like sense of uh, what I'm doing and what it's doing. And, uh, yeah, you can quickly uh, <laughs> get lost into that. And uh, that's one of the biggest ways to uh, get your credibility uh, as a bird watcher. kind of just uh, doubt it as saying, oh, this bird was doing something and uh, it seemed very human. Because yeah. mm. that just ends up being in a spot where you start making stories of what they're doing rather than what they're actually doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, observation and then getting to interpretation. And so, yeah, that's one of the biggest mm-hmm. things that I've had to like kind of tell myself in the field to just, okay, maybe this bird isn't doing something just because I think that it's like... Uh, because my human brain is working some sort of way. Mm. 
But how do you draw that line? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've, it's something that you've had to develop over time. Mm-hmm. But how do you draw that line in terms of, okay, I'm actually not making this up and I'm actually seeing what I am seeing? It's really, it's really hard to. I definitely understand that, like, especially now and that I've had a lot of experience, it's extremely difficult to, like, distance yourself from just understanding and putting yourself into a bird's kind of eye. But... Hmm. Typically, if you can see it interacting with something and kind of it acting in a certain way that can be explained by something else physically there. So uh, Hmm. if you can relate it to it protecting its nest, something, some natural, natural uh, instincts, if you can relate it back to that, Uh, if you can think about, oh, it's foraging for food in a certain way, if it's you know, and sometimes it's really hard because birds are very clever. They, a lot of birds are very uh, smart about things like uh, making sure that they can distract predators. There's, there's some birds that will even pretend to be injured and flop around on the ground, leading people away from their nests, and then just leap away once they're sure that the threat has been uh, sufficiently distracted. And so. It's, oh, it's, wow. a, it's quite the fine line of like, is this bird doing something this smart or is this bird doing something, you know, that's just, I'm just interpreting as more complex than it needs to be. Hmm. Does having to study some of these, like through research papers or through documentation, uh, help in terms of actually analyzing them in the field? Uh, definitely. I'd say, uh, one of the biggest things about science is just like people think it's all people knowing things, knowing things and getting things exactly right. It's really not. It's just like a big giant group project. Honestly, science is just all of us comparing notes and saying, huh, did you think that that was the same thing? Cause that's kind of what I saw here. And yeah. So as boring as it is sometimes trawling through lots and lots of papers and seeing how people measured their specific ways of studying it and, the observations that they draw from their different uh, methods helps a lot, helps a lot to understand whether something is actually like truly natural or if it's just something that we're all just making up in our collective human brains. Mm. Yeah. Something that you said there just sort of reminded me of this thought I uh, remember hearing somewhere. Mm. Uh, a lot of a lot of science is just us researching things, right? Because there are things that already exist yeah. that have probably been documented by a lot of people in the past, mm-hmm. be it ancient civilizations or be it scientists like 20 or 30 years back. But yeah. our duty is sort of to just research that and maybe implement it in the world that we're living in right now. So, like, I, mean, I just wanted to add that there. But uh, <laughs> in terms of studying behaviors, if there's some interesting facts that you'd like to share about birds... Um, I'd like for you to share a couple of facts that, you know, some of us, well, for example, when we see a crow, you don't necessarily think about, or sparrow for that matter, or any Mm -hmm. birds that are common to this part of the world. Yeah. Well, definitely something that I've, uh, I've always wanted to see, but never actually really been able to experience it is, um, a lot of small birds, songbirds, like tiny frail looking things that you normally think, oh, those couldn't fight anything at all uh is that one big one important way to think about it is they are very smart about like coming together to fend off predators um one of the Mm. methods that we can usually get birds small birds to uh come towards our direction is to set up a uh radio that's playing uh the call of some larger and like some larger bird, so an owl or a hawk or something like that. And you'll get small birds that will start swarming to that direction because they'll try to, by sheer numbers, try to rush uh, the bigger predator out of their area and uh, collectively just oh, defend wow. their nest. Uh, that's, so mm-hmm. I've never been able to witness that. I'm sure that if I set up a proper camera and watching station and had that all set up, that I'd be able to watch that. But no, I've never seen that, but it's uh, it works definitely. We've seen how much like mm. we've seen swarms and swarms of little tiny little bluebirds that come out from the field, just hopping up and like searching around with their heads, trying to find where's that where's that big old 
Al that we need to hunt down and get out of here. Uh, there's mm. that. There's a lot of uh, interesting behaviors with a lot of um, a lot of uh, hawks and stuff like that uh, here in Oklahoma. It's not not quite as not quite as defined, but um, uh, definitely in some of the more elevation diverse areas there's a lot of uh birds that will specifically set them out to certain elevations uh, and they'll be you'll see different as you walk up a mountain for example or you'll see specifically which birds live at which areas and you can tell which altitudes they fly at you can kind of determine oh what their roles are in uh, the ecological space since um a lot of uh, birds that soar really really high up are a lot of the larger carrion birds that just wait to see where there's a lot of uh, other smaller birds diving down to just basically seeing, Oh, what, what can I scrounge up from there? There's a lot of fun. Mm. That was one of the, uh, one of the things I learned from our uh, end of ornithology project. Um, whenever we uh, mm. all decided on one bird to kind of uh, pick out and uh, observe. So interesting. interesting. Yeah. There's something earlier you said that popped a question in my mind. Uh, mm. You mentioned about the crow in your background and you described it as she. So, I mean, this might be a stupid and ignorant question, but <laughs> how do you tell the bird's gender? It's really hard to tell bird gender, especially here, because unlike in the tropics where the male is usually very, very distinct, here it's birds are kind of just uh, very similar. Uh, I think... The best analogy I could make uh, for some of, my, some of the people I was helping to try and understand it is, if you do you know about how Pokemon have different like differences between the male and female versions? It's a lot like that. It's something that you would never notice while you're actually playing the game, but it's something that once it's pointed mm. out to you, it becomes very obvious. And for birds, sometimes mm. it's just like that. You'll have very very small tiny differences like um the bird that i specifically was working a lot to study was the meadowlark and the males and females they're pretty much the same size pretty much the same build the only difference is the females have a slightly thinner band uh on their feathers which is something that you would never see because you know out in the field they're flying around they're hopping around they're running around in tall grass uh inside their nests and just it's really really difficult to tell that but one big thing that you can kind of if you know a little bit on the background of how um, that bird behaves typically you can kind of tell in the field whether it's a male or female depending on some behaviors so, which is mm. part of the why, reason why i was uh, very interested in behaviors so i was like well, this can kind of like help to explain a lot more of the bird pre like preemptively you know uh before mm -hmm. you even see it, you can kind of use these sorts of things uh, to check off, oh, is this bird acting a certain way? It might be this. And so, for example, like I was talking about the crow, she's a female because uh, females, female crows are much more protective of their nest because male crows are very um, here and then gone. That's one, mm. that's, that's one thing I have to say about birds. They're very... Um, it's a little uh it's a little wild with the birds and uh how they uh handle their nests which mm. is a whole different whole different thing but, uh, yeah. For, that was going to be my next question mm -hmm. in the sense that are female birds more territorial in comparison to male birds because they have to protect the nest and protect their eggs it really depends honestly there's a lot mm. of uh there's so many different birds. Uh, one of the birds, for example, that um, uh, that one of our previous lab students, uh, she already graduated and moved on and is working on her own field to study. But um, she studied these uh, birds that live uh, basically on top of, walking around on top of uh, lily pads and stuff, uh, surface uh, flora uh, in South America. And mm -hmm. they're completely reversed from what you would think. The females are huge and the ones always fighting. And they have these big shield beaks that uh, help protect their eyes whenever they're fighting and trying to peck at each other. And the males are the ones that always mm -hmm. sit on the nests and they're very small and demure. And uh, it's, um, 
it's very uh, backwards from what a lot of people think. Oh, the male bird's going to be the biggest one. But uh, then you'll have actual cases where the male bird is like pretty, pretty significantly larger, but it's just because uh, the male birds are fighting a lot more for uh, female bird attention because of their populations are just that kind of uh, different uh, gender ratio or sex ratio. Sorry. I, uh, I, I slapped myself right there because uh, that's one thing we've, <laughs> we've uh, talked about. Gender and sex are very different things. And it's, uh, I've had to like, growing up here in Oklahoma, you know, it's kind of uh, red, it's kind of a uh, more conservative, less, uh, you know, kind of that kind of state. And so I've had to really distance myself from saying gender of the bird to sex of the bird. There's a very di- big difference. But, um, yeah, there's all sorts of different things. There are many, many types of birds that will just not have their own nests at all. Like cuckoos, they'll literally just plop their eggs in some other bird's nest and say, this is your problem now, and just head out. <laughs> that's that's okay. the entire yeah, that's the entire premise for a lot of these. Uh, they're called nest parasites. And uh, sometimes the birds will recognize this, this egg is very different. It's like half... It's like one and a half times the size of my other eggs, totally different color. I should boot it out of the nest. And the other times, it'll just work. And the big cuckoo baby will be twice the size of the other birds in the nest and just gobble up all the food. And the mom will be able to do nothing because it'll be almost as big as her. So, yeah. Mm. Bird reproduction is a wild, wild field. Yeah, that, that you mentioning that is really fascinating because I'd heard a fact, I'd heard that fact that you mentioned about the mm-hmm. uh, cuckoo bird, but um, yeah, it, like every like the manner in which they sort of adapt and behave is overall quite fascinating because um, in a lot of ways, like I mean, I know you mentioned earlier, like it sort of affects the credibility of mm-hmm. an ornithologist to sort of make up stories, but if you were to sort of draw parallels to human behavior. There's a lot of things that even we do in our sort of reproductive lives or um, as species in general mm-hmm. that there can be some parallels drawn. Am I just making that up or is that true? Like, can you actually draw parallels between <laughs> human behavior and bird behavior? I mean, I think I think the best way to avoid drawing parallels where they don't exist too much is to think about it evolutionarily. That's one of the biggest mm. uh, things that I've always been kind of falling back on whenever I'm trying to explain bird behavior was whether this makes sense in the whole kind of scheme of evolution. um, For example, if having it, so then your offspring can successfully parasite off of some other bird. If that works, then it's going to sustain itself through uh, reproductive uh, generations and just, You'll see that happen and it won't disappear, which, Hmm. you know, can be said of humans as well. It's just sometimes a reproductively successful technique, which um, (laughs) we have our own morals ascribed to it. um, Right. Yeah. But um, I, I, I think that looking at it in a, whether it's evolutionarily successful, kind of few can kind of help to say, more than more than just uh, saying, oh, this is similar to what humans do. It's yeah, right. a little bit less, uh, <laughs> a little bit less um, biased. There's the word. Mm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Uh, initially, when we were talking, you mentioned that you'd prefer to go to different places of the world to sort of um, <laughs> analyze different birds. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what places are those? Like, uh, are they like the tropics in the Amazon or? Like in Asia, and what birds necessarily were you in, were you interested in sort of studying about? If you don't mind sharing, I'm definitely interested in kind of seeing what birds are in different parts of the world. There's some birds that are very specifically endemic or native to the U.S. that are pretty unique mm. and pretty interesting to see. But um, you also have the same thing said of uh, a lot of other places. Uh, there's unique to, one's unique to Asia, one's unique to specifically Africa. Uh, but the biggest, uh, biggest 
biodiversity spot hotspot for birds is definitely going to be South America. Amazon rainforest. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure everybody has this idea of just how like huge it is. It's way bigger than you imagine. And so there's whole subspecies. Like I want, I went to uh, a conference once, uh, the American Ornithology Society, and I got into a talk with some uh, grad student who'd actually gone down there, and she spent almost an hour while we were having lunch trying to explain the specific narrow lines of distribution of different, slightly different birds that they're all like, this could possibly become a new species because biodiversity there is just constantly thriving and mm-hmm. generating and just diverging and branching off. And so it's, it's uh, definitely very interesting. I would love to be able to, I, I mean, it happens over the course of huge, huge time spans, but I'd love to be able to, you know, see like, or at least know someone in the field who could uh, kind of, you know, be there to witness, Oh, this is kind of a separate bird species. And uh, most of the time it happens retroactively. You'll be noticing something uh, hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years after the fact uh, of whether a bird is actually a different, but um, sometimes that's just how it is. And uh, I would love to be able to witness uh, us discovering something new in the Amazon or somewhere else entirely. Uh, personally, I'm a little bit uh, less inclined to go to the Amazon. I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit afraid of some of the uh, dangers there. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. not great with insects, uh, which mm-hmm. is which is which is really really uh, really ironic because uh, <laughs> because my partner is very 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 much into insects. So it's like, oh, mm. well, I'll let you handle those, but uh, I'm gonna just uh, have my distance here. But um, yeah, um, I've. But uh, yeah, I've been mostly kind of looking into kind of seeing what unique birds there are in uh, the uh, Eastern world uh, since I've spent all my life basically just uh, here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And um, yeah, I definitely want to, uh, I think I have my eyes set a little bit more specifically on New Zealand. Uh, one because mm. uh, just I have family there and I've seen just there's a lot of really beautiful like nature there, but also they have mm-hmm. a lot of uh, unique bird species there uh, like ground parrots. They have a whole wide range of uh, different uh, small birds that diverged uh, specifically because they're an island chain there, and they have penguins mm-hmm. as well. It's just a huge, oh, really? a huge list of biodiversity. Yeah, on the uh, so a lot of different things that I could kind of explore and kind of, uh, you know, familiarize myself with, uh, hopefully as I grow up, which, uh, mm. I, I can only hope that, uh, it'll be able to sustain just, um, uh, because now we're getting to the, uh, to the uh, topic of climate and, uh, how that's affecting all those biodiversity. Cause, uh, Right. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of big changes, and um, mm-hmm. that's one of the things I've had to kind of think about. Like, I'm planning these things, and I'm like, oh, I'll definitely want to go here and see these kinds of birds and explore this locale or whatever. But some of that's starting to uh, disappear. The Amazon. I mean, we that story. What was it? 2019, 2020 when the Amazon had that huge burn that was caused by humans that, Mm -hmm. you know, it knocked out a huge part of uh, core environment, which ruined a whole bunch of uh, natural habitat for many, many uh, different species for birds, for lots of land animals as well, for even fish because of the uh, different nutrients that were being spread around to the local streams. It's, Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a little frightening thinking of just how little there might be in the future. I will say. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned climate change and how that can sort of affect 
a lot of these you know different uh bird species um what are certain changes that you've noticed in your study that possibly have made endangered birds extinct or birds that were abundantly present endangered well it's not it's not super uh not super um, obvious here in the US or central US at least uh here mm-hmm. climate change is just kind of just shifting things around a little bit the weather out here has always mm-hmm. been kind of iffy and uh, if there's one or two more storms if there's one or two more big freezes during the winter and big droughts during the summer that's not going to affect uh a lot of birds here, I think, because uh, birds are much, much more mobile. But um, hmm. it's it's very noticeable for birds that have very small ranges. That's uh, so when we talk about bird ranges, that's uh, the areas that they nest in, where they migrate to if they migrate, and where they have uh, their normal overwintering is what we usually call it uh, spots. And so. For a lot of birds that have those very small ranges or very specific areas that they can live in, um, then you'll see a lot of die-off and uh, alterations to their routes. And sometimes the ranges will just shrink so much that they have to, you know, completely reset their entire, like, kind of... uh, how to, I, don't know, I don't know how to explain exactly, but um, they'll just kind of disappear from the biological record and just kind of merge sometimes with uh, other closely related, related mm. species. So one of the examples I can best think yeah. of is um, uh, the birds that I study, the uh, meadowlarks. Like, um, there's pockets of very unique uh, eastern or not Eastern, Western meadowlarks that live out in Colorado and that kind of area, Colorado, uh, New Mexico kind of area, um, that just have their own pocket and have evolved kind of separately because the ranges that the Westerns, well, this is the supposed theory uh, so far based on some of the papers that I've gotten to uh, read uh, there. But um, there's a, Whole that whole range of uh, used to be westerns are now called the Lulians uh, meadowlarks because they use they are very closely related to wet- westerns. Their call is very similar. It's a nice mix of westerns and easterns, but the, it's assumed mm. that their range spread out there and then spread back because of some changes, ecological changes. Maybe it was human interaction pushing the species apart. Whatever it was that they just live as their own separate kind of group now and so Mm. we don't know whether they can hybridize back with westerns and easterns whether they can mate with westerns and easterns and actually successfully produce a offspring and um it's just a lot of these things will just have to shift and change and a lot of times uh, i see a lot of maps that show bird ranges it's very very specific but they're very, very blurry lines, especially once you get to those tiny, tiny, minuscule differences. Because uh, um, as far as we can visually see, uh, there's not a whole lot of difference between Easterns and Westerns and Lillians. It's really mostly in their song and some of their behaviors. So hmm. uh, it's it's very blurry on where there might be hybrids here, there might be hybrids elsewhere. It just hasn't really been studied a lot. Although... I know that there's another student as well who's working on that hybridization problem uh, over in University of uh, Colorado in Boulder, I believe. But um, yeah, it's um, it's a uh, it's it's very interesting to kind of um, think about how mm. that might actively be happening due to the climate change and other anthropomorphic actions, human caused just mm. movements and developments yeah right uh does the darwinian concept of survival of the fittest sort of play a role in it as well it kind of does uh you'll see a lot of things like um here it's very common here in the u.s and a lot of suburban areas where there's a lot of new development but you can also see it in places like brazil where they've recently cut down huge swaths of forest for uh land development and uh 
just for home development, stuff like that. You'll see a lot of species just straight up disappear because they're not fit enough or not smart enough or not able to really cohabitat with humans. And uh, hmm. a lot of birds will, they'll either learn to use human buildings and other human created structures as nesting spots and uh, learn to uh, live, you know, basically picking up human food, uh, scraps and stuff like that. Or they'll just have to, you know, retreat to a different, more core habitat that they may not be used to living on. And uh, it's very... Hmm. It's very interesting because you'll see a lot of things like uh, if you go to any major American city, you'll see pigeons around there. Uh, they'll just be totally fine with humans just uh, living it up, getting fed seeds and uh, right. celery and all sorts of things. Um, but then you'll uh, think about, oh, we actually don't see any of XYZ bird species anymore because they've all moved to somewhere else way further north or way less developed because their natural range here in this normal area that, that used to they used to inhibit or inhabit words uh, just isn't there for them anymore. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you mentioned something about smart and pigeons and sort of you, it brought up the image that you just mentioned mm -hmm. of how pigeons are very much adaptive to human society and that they flock in places where they get fed because um, where my dad lives in the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the times he puts out some grains on his window and a lot of pigeons tend to flock every day in the morning and sort of feed on the grains that he leaves there. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of like the smartness of birds, what are some things that, you know, don't necessarily, we don't necessarily think about. But then if you, when you look at birds and like sort of the behavior in which they do certain things with their smartness that you uh, found fascinating. I, a lot of these uh, stories are more from uh, anecdotal stories. So uh, a little bit, take these with a little bit of salt, but um, you'll see a lot of um, things where, uh, a lot of crows and other corvids, uh, those, uh, you, you, you'll, um, kind of see them as like ravens, crows, all those very ominous, dark black birds that you'll kind of see. Um, they're very, very smart. Uh, they'll recognize human faces and voices and stuff like that. And they'll very quickly latch on to like, Oh, this person is a friend or it's a food source. I can get food from them or, they'll specifically, mm. you know, be not harmful or at all. And so they'll learn to develop to um, recognize people who they're living in close proximity to. And uh, sometimes if you help them out with food, they'll learn, they'll remember these sorts of things and they'll bring you back shiny things, gifts of like tin cans and like those little uh, soda <laughs> cap things and all sorts of things. Because – Birds kind of understand a lot of these, uh, a lot of these very intelligent corvids. They'll kind of understand that, oh, you may not be one of our species, but if we can kind of have that mutual relationship there, then uh, we can both benefit from it. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting to like understand that some of the birds can be very grateful to like small human actions. So. It's uh, it's 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 mm -hmm. pretty it's pretty interesting because you'll uh, hear stories sometimes of how whenever a couple that has lived there for ages and ages moves away and some new family comes in, the birds will really not like it and they'll like be very distrustful of the new family and uh, not hang around that specific house anymore or anything like that. And just really kind of they'll recognize that hey, our favorite humans aren't here anymore. We need to act differently around mm. this area yeah and even some of the dumber birds mm. like people always characterize pigeons as very very stupid and stuff like that but pigeons are pretty smart about knowing other like knowing human routines so they'll see humans mm. sticking their hands in their pockets and they'll immediately know oh this person's probably going to grab me some food here so they'll flock to specific people before mm -hmm. any sign of food has ever been shown 
So, yeah, they'll uh, mm. they'll kind of understand the, these sorts of things. Then, on the other hand, you have things like uh, Canadian geese, which uh, I've gotten plenty of uh, experience with. They'll hiss and at any human that comes by their nest sometimes even if we're like i have food i have some corn kernels for you and they'll just yeah which is probably a smart like uh, nest protecting behavior but also it's like come on man i've seen you here for like five weeks in a row for three days a week (laughs) i'm not that unfamiliar right uh, right right so birds can be very Uh, smart but also kind of dummies sometimes whenever it comes to uh <laughs> when we when we expect them to to recognize something because hmm. yeah i read this fact somewhere about uh pigeons being used uh in ancient greece to carry like Olymp- the results for the olympics or something like that yeah but, uh, you, yeah. you yeah that's the reason why a lot of birds have been trained as over time as like messengers because birds are very very smart when it comes to remembering roots especially um their uh their inherited like um natural uh, migration patterns you'll see a lot of very mm-hmm. young birds that will make the trip once and it will be burned to their minds because um it's just something that evolutionarily developed that they have that kind of sense and so a lot of birds will be able to like if you put them in one spot at one point of year they'll kind of have this idea of like oh i know where i am i know where i need to be i know where and i think one of the biggest surprises that came to me is a lot of birds actually use uh stars as their guides as well they'll use uh knowledge of like what stars are where and what stars are in what position to kind of navigate themselves to uh, their nesting or overwintering spots, which is, uh, mm. you know, it's like, wow, that's something that human sailors took a long time to kind of uh, figure out. And uh, here are birds just naturally like, figuring out these young birds, only a couple months old, just being like, ah, yes, right there. I know exactly where to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That's really fascinating. Cause, um, I used to live in the Middle East in the United Arab Emirates and mm-hmm. um, I've always heard anecdotes of, uh, I forget where from, but I do know that flamingos sort of migrate to a certain region in the country. Mm. Um, even f- I'm forgetting details about when, what time of the year and um, where they migrate from. But mm-hmm. there's a lot of flamingos that usually flock uh, in this place called Ras al uh, mm. in the United Arab Emirates and like it's just fascinating to see how certain small signals from nature like be it the stars like you said or be it certain wind currents or whatever that sort of helps them guide them in a, in a certain path mm-hmm. um, yeah I just find that really fascinating because evolutionarily speaking uh, do you know what sort of went into it or what made them that way honestly it's not something I could answer, uh, but um, just uh, if you think about it, just having a way, a built-in kind of way to know your directions, to know which way to go to whenever you need to reproduce, it's just something that evolution is going to just narrow down and hone to a fine edge. You know, just because um, mm. if it boosts your reproductive success, evolution's going to say that's a good one. We're keeping that. Mm. True, because a lot of it is rooted with, like you said, reproductive success in terms of mm-hmm. keeping the species alive and yeah. uh, not going extinct. So that's mm-hmm. definitely true. Because yeah. um, again, this is an ecology class that I took probably <laughs> a year and a half back. Mm-hmm. I remember something fascinating about the Galapagos Island and how there's certain birds there that have sort of gone through an evolution of their own in the past, like, 70, 80, or even 100 years, mm-hmm. um, to sort of adjust to that environment. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of things that are really fascinating. Uh, and I don't know if you're someone that watches any of these documentaries related to these, but if you have... Can you suggest suggest any that you've watched or any sort of places that people can go to to sort of learn more about these things? Oh, if you're I, curious. Hmm. 
I I haven't I don't really know. I don't watch a lot of uh, TV and stuff like that. But uh, I've definitely enjoyed a lot of the documentaries about um, with David Attenborough. Just partially because his voice is fantastic, but also because he has a kind of he has a kind of understanding. I feel like he's just hmm. spent a lot of time in nature, and you'll see him uh, just interacting with a lot of these birds, and he uh, very obviously knows how to handle them properly, to like not approach them too aggressively, to not approach them with certain kind of hand gestures and stuff like that, just to make him seem more or less threatening, I guess, and more uh, friendly. Uh, hmm. but honestly any bird documentary is good just because you get to see birds <laughs> in my eyes <laughs> but uh, do you have a favorite one i really enjoyed the planet earth series i have to say because um especially once uh they started kind of talking about some of the climate change issues uh, and how that's affecting a lot of birds because that's something that i never really kind of studied personally Hmm. But I've really, really been uh, – it's something that's really wedged its way into my uh, brain just uh, as I've started to study and be out in the field because, I mean, even here in Oklahoma, you can kind of see how climate change is really affecting things. Summers here are becoming very dry and long and you'll get huge droughts. And then during the winter, you'll get enormous ice storms and – sudden free flash freezes and stuff like that like the one we recently experienced well that's all just because of climate mm-hmm. change so we've had we've had a great conversation over here about birds and evolution and a lot more and i'm going to make sure to attach some of the links on the bottom of this or on the description of the podcast rather uh, so make sure to check those out if you're curious to learn more uh, but without further ado we're going to transition into uh, the latter stages of the podcast uh, starting off with the segment I call Bish Bash Bosh, uh, which basically is a word association game uh, where I give the guests um, five words which are recurring on every episode. And um, the guest has to respond to them in three words or in three phrases. So, for example, Sydney, if I was to say the word birds, what are the three things that come into your mind when I say the word birds? It's sort of how we're going to go about this. Does that hmm. make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So the first word is differences. What comes to your mind when I say the word differences? Hmm. I was going to say important. Hmm. Important in many. It's a lot harder than it than is. <laughs> It's okay. Anything, anything that pops up into your head first. Hmm. The three things that shoot right at you. Yeah, important. Many, but I feel distraction as well. Distraction is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, Just since. Interesting. I feel like yeah. Sometimes. Interesting. It's gonna be a distraction. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, the second word is nuances. What comes to your mind when I say the word nuance? <laughs> I immediately thought of uh, peer review. Okay. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> there's plenty of that uh, in my field. But um, peer review, yeah. nuance. Two more things that pop up in your head along with peer review? Hmm. I don't really know. Nuance. (laughs) I knew they related to behavior, but also mm -hmm. that's just probably because I'm focusing on birds uh, and nuance. I think I think a lot of uh, sometimes politics. Sorry, could you say that again? I sort of lost you there for a second. Oh, uh, politics. That's where I hear okay. they want a lot. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And the third word is learning. What comes to your mind when I say the word learning? Learning. 
teacher. Mm. Uh, that's probably because I got my own interest in uh, education and science education and experience, honestly. Mm. So teacher, science, experience. Cool, cool, cool. The fourth word is empathy. What comes to your mind when I say the word empathy? <laughs> Birds, because I empathize too much with them. <laughs> uh, a little too much, but also family and um, it's people in general. Mm. Yeah. Cool. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And for the last <laughs> word for this segment, uh, similarities. What comes to your mind when I say the word similarities? Is it bad I instantly thought of birds again? <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not. I instantly just went immediately to my metalarks and uh Yeah. I feel like similarities are really community and uh community and working together. And what was the last one? Uh, working together. Working together. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's that's beautiful because, yeah, I mean, you need to be able to work together as people. And a lot of the times, like, being able to relate to each other and sort of seeking similarities goes a long way. Uh, so thank you so much for playing along in this segment. We beautifully, <laughs> like, saying working together beautifully transitions into the next question that I have for you, which is, uh, how do you relate to people? <laughs> relate to people i do my best to try and find similar interests i think mm. just see what i can say that they'll be able to latch on to and uh you know then go from there see what else we can find that to talk about that can kind of you know let us understand each other a little bit more beautiful and for the last question, well, I've been saying this on every episode, but just stop mm -hmm. calling this a question because it's not really a question, but it's more of a request. Uh, if you could leave us with a positive thought or a positive quote before we close off, what would that quote be? Something you'd like to share, some wisdom, some philosophy, whatever it might be <laughs> for everybody who's listening and watching. Do your best to change the world. And if you don't, I feel like the progress that you make getting to those steps will be enough for you. Sorry, could you say that again? Because I lost you there again. For a second, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, do your best to change the world. And even if you don't, the steps that you make along the way will help better you. Beautiful. Definitely. Because... I think a lot of the times the words change the world can seem really daunting, but if you're just taking a step towards doing your best, you're going to go a long way. Definitely. That's beautiful. Um, Sydney, I mean, we went through a few technical issues. Um, <laughs> those of you all watching or listening might notice that, but um, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and uh, sharing your story about your interests behind birds and some interesting facts about them. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. So thank you. I really appreciate you having me. It was very freeing to be able to talk to someone other than all the rest of the bird nerds in my group about birds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad that we could have this conversation. So thank you to you, Sydney, and thank you to everybody who's listening or watching. Um, we'll see you guys next time. Cool. Thank you for watching this episode of Perspective Platoon with Pratik. Make sure to mention in the comment section below some of the things that you found intriguing, interesting or relatable about this conversation. Make sure to also check the description box below for other sources of information and content that we've talked about today. Make sure to also like this video, share it around and subscribe to the channel and make sure to also hit the bell icon to never miss another episode. I've said make sure a lot of the times but I'd really appreciate it if you all did all of these things. And uh, thank you so much for being a part of this platoon of perspectives and checking out the conversations that are dropped on this page every week. I really appreciate you for doing so. Until next time, stay safe, take care, 
And don't forget to keep your mind open to different perspectives because you never know, random relatability might just be around the corner. <laughs>